Terrific. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Friday, February 12th, and this is a meeting of Senate Education. Uh, before we start, uh, hearing from some of our <clears throat> guests uh, around their experience as at the Community College of Vermont, I wanted to just raise one topic, and that is this uh, if you will sort of shift uh, in our state colleges. I know we have had um, some testimony, some conversations around um, what's gonna happen, uh, when it's going to happen, our role. And what I thought, and I'm really looking for input here from all of you, given that it is such a big topic and uh, one that will be on the floor, uh, certainly when the budget's brought out, um, and certainly one that is in the community, our communities a lot. I recommended to the pro tem that perhaps the best way for us to get Senate colleagues up to date is for us to have a caucus of the whole, or at least the opportunity for senators to hear directly from Mr. Prescott, the, I think one of the authors of the report, if not the primary author, a little bit from even maybe last year's Senate committee. Um, but it, it's going to be one of those things that we are all going to have to vote on when it comes uh, to the budget, um, when it comes to what kinds of dollars we are going to invest in our state colleges moving forward. Uh, and so uh, rather than I think every one of our colleagues reaching out to each of us saying, hey, what do you think? I mean, we, we will continue to, to, to learn about it, but I think given the enormity of the shift and uh, the financial investment, it seems to me that we, we do this as a caucus of a whole, or at least give people the opportunity, if they don't want to come to a meeting, um, to, uh, that, that, that there's a time to, you know, to have these questions. So I just want to throw that out to to all of you to see if that's something um, you're all comfortable with. And maybe even a little bit about what you're hearing in your communities. Um, oh, Senator Hooker. Senator, Senator Campion, we're certainly hearing a lot in, in our area of the state. Uh, and I think it would be an excellent idea for us to get um, from the horse's mouth as it were, what the report is about and the interpretation that um, the committee has seen because um, we're getting a lot of differing um, testimony, you might might say, as to you know what is in the report and what it means and how it would be how it'll affect especially um, the various parts of the state that have the state colleges in them. Senator Terenzini. Yeah, I, I completely concur uh, with Senator Hooker. We're really here, especially with Castleton around the corner, we're getting inundated with questions and concerns and so on. So I think it's really important we need to get up to speed and understand where we stand because there's a, like Senator Hooker said, there's a lot of different uh, rumors and half truths out there and, and who knows what the, the real deal is, so. Yeah, Senator Lyons. So I was going to agree with that, but also, um, do you think there's any, um, I, I have no clue how much time that caucus as a whole would take, um, it, you know, could take a half an hour, could take it an hour. But the other issue that might be <clears throat> important to consider within that caucus, if it could be split in two, I don't know, um, is the waiting study. Ah. I'm, there's so there are so many questions out there, concerns being expressed by that. So I I don't want to derail the the higher ed discussion. I think that's critically important, no question. But if if there is time to throw in a brief update on what is or is not in the waiting study, that might be also useful. That. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. no, I'm happy to bring that to the pro tem. I mean, I know that uh, we are scheduled to have a uh, 
a joint hearing with uh, finance on the waiting study. I believe Senator Cummings wants to do it a week from Tuesday. So that should give at least the two committees that are primarily responsible uh, for um, that kind of work, some, some additional information. Uh, and we agreed to do it uh, as a joint committee you know, given that, and given that it like, without a doubt, it'll end up in finance, no matter um, whether, you know, when we pass it out, if, if that's what we decide to do. The other big piece, as I think I've mentioned, is what, what the House is interested in and um, whether or not they would indeed pick up this work if we were to spend um, time working on it. And that's something that I know the pro tem is in conversation with the speaker about. Senator Persley? Was that last comment on the waiting study or something else about whether the house could take it up? Oh, that was on the waiting study. Yeah, Good. that was on the waiting study. Sorry, I wasn't clear. Uh, that is indeed, um, I, I, you know, I know that this, the house in the past has had some concerns. Uh, and again, I, I don't have an update, but um, I know that uh, Senator Ballant and Representative Krowinski are in conversations. Yes, Senator Karenzini. I don't want to interrupt the train of thought, Senator Campion, but um, another thing that maybe we are going to talk about or you could help me is uh, the last week, for some reason, my email box has been inundated with people wanting to talk about S13, the pupil waiting study. Is that something that we're yeah. going to be? Okay. Yeah. So that's what we were just talking about. Uh, How did I miss that? I'm right here. You know, we see you. That's for sure. Uh <laughs> Uh, no, I know it, it might just, it, what might have caused confusion actually is people have been just sending messages saying S13, S13, S13. Okay. Uh, that, yeah, just so you know, that that is the pupil waiting study. And um, we will have uh, a meeting with uh, Senate Finance, a joint hearing on, uh, I believe it's a week from Tuesday with Senator Cummings committee. Yeah, okay, and, all right. And that's good, no, 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 no. Uh, and that'll be, give everybody an opportunity to sort of see what we think and what direction we want to go in. But I do know that this committee passed out a version of that waiting study um, last year. So uh, it's- um, I also did see, I did see Senator Chin and laugh at me pretty hard. So I'm not gonna forget that. <laughs> no, and you know, I'll be honest with you, Senator Terenziti, uh, you shouldn't forget it because he'll be on the floor before you know it. And you and the family can be up late getting questions ready for, for whatever. Well, actually, it is one of the, the things about the Senate, and I'm looking to the senior senator from Chittenden to confirm this, but committee members don't really go after committee members. Uh, that is- No, that's true. Uh, that that, that's kind that, of the unwritten rule. Right. Although if the committee member is reporting a bill from another committee that he might be on, then that's a different story. Totally different story. Yeah, that's totally different. different story. My internet connection might go out that day and it'll fall. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Senator Perslick, please. So on the waiting study, just want to be clear with, with folks that the study is the study and it's already out and, and the study had some recommendations. So S13 basically implements what the study is recommending that we do. And I think there, there is a, I can't remember, there's a difference with the House bill. I think the House bill does it over multiple years and the Senate bill takes a little different tack on how, how to roll it out. Yeah. No, thanks for that clarification. I appreciate that. And I just want to point out to Senator Terenzini that we may be here, but it's only virtual. So, you know, it might, it might make a difference. Uh, good old Rutland. It's not the state senators. It's the issue with the library moving. It's something with Rutland County. Uh, all right. With that, thank you. We are now moving on to post-secondary education opportunities. And I see three of our witnesses are here. Uh, and please correct me uh, if I'm mispronouncing your name, but Mr. Carrera, uh, Mr. Abbott, and Ms. O'Black. Uh, would you reveal yourselves to us? There we go, terrific. Hey everyone. Hi. Thanks so much for uh, being with us. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, I, I think, okay. They're, they're a little late, but I see our other two, I see uh, 
Joyce is here. Okay, Joyce, you got here just in the neck. We 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 started at one fifteen. Um, oh, I thought you were starting at one thirty. I'm sorry. No, it's it's no problem at all. Uh, you really did get here in the nick of time, so we can absolutely uh, turn it right over to you to introduce uh, the students that we were about to uh, hear from. Well, that is perfect, and thank you. I'm sorry about the confusion in the time. No, nope, um, no problem at all. Likely, it's my fault. So no, that's quite all right. Um, so I just want to begin by thanking you for the opportunity to to share with you a little bit um, about the McClure gift. And what's most exciting is to hear directly from some of our students. Um, and I think you heard um, from the McClure Foundation um, a couple of days ago, or well, yesterday or the day before, um, and um, Carolyn Ware and the McClure Foundation, I just want to acknowledge are just amazing partners with us and have been for a number of years and have really helped to provide us with, uh, with funding to do some pretty innovative and creative things. So um, we just are incredibly grateful <clears throat> to the McClure Foundation um, for their thinking and their partnership. But, you know, this particular gift came about um, um, I think that the foundation was really looking at this in, in um, two primary reasons. One, to really acknowledge and say to the class of 2020, we care about you. We know that you've gone through a lot and here we wanna give you a leg up. Um, and here's um, a way if to either um, uh, get started or to add to what you were already planning to take um, for the fall. And what was, I think what has been amazing about the McClure Foundation gift is the clarity and the simplicity. It was, if you have graduated from a Vermont high school in 2020, um, no matter what your goals or your, your financial background or whatever, you are entitled to this. And you can take any course that you want. There was no parameters around. It's a three credit course or a four credit course. Any course that you are, you are academically eligible for, you can take. So it was very simple. It was very simple to administer. And I think the message to the public was um, it was easy to explain. And so, you know, working with the McClure Foundation, it was just really nice to be able to do that. And as, as you know, um, you heard from Carolyn that more than 600 Vermont students um, took advantage of that. And, um, and, and, well, 80% of them, um, which is pretty phenomenal, have said they are planning to continue their education. We have more than 50% that are continuing their education this spring, which is pretty phenomenal given the COVID environment and, and everything that is going on. And we expect that number actually to climb, but it's interesting. Um, we have more than 50% are enrolled at CCV or about 50% are enrolled at CCV. The, if students went to another school, that information isn't uploaded into the National Clearinghouse until after the drop ad period. So we expect that that number will be higher because we know some people took a course at CCD and are going have gone to some other place um, this spring. So we're pretty impressed with um, with what students have done as a result of that. Um, one additional, in addition to the students that you're going to hear today, um, I've been working with Jeannie um, to post. We had um, the McClure Foundation shared with us a letter from us from a parent, and we got permission from the parent and student to post this letter. So you will see that. In addition to this, um, it's pretty heartwarming, and um, it came unsolicited to the McClure Foundation, and they knew we were going to we were having some testimony today. And Carolyn said, you know, this would be a great thing to share with the committee. So I would encourage you to, to take a look at that as well. Great. So, you know, Senator Campion said, you know, you wanted to hear directly from students and we are, you know, it's always so wonderful to hear from students and their stories and what, what has made a difference in their lives and, and what they're doing with that. So um, we're excited to have three students today. I've invited Katie Mobley, who's our Dean of Enrollment and Community Relations to sort of manage this because, you know, in a Zoom environment, you know, somebody starts to talk and then another person starts to talk and then no one talks. And so I've asked her to sort of moderate this in a way so that there's no awkward moments. And so she's actually gonna call on students. And then um, in the end, we wanna make sure we leave time for you all to ask um, students questions. 
So we expect to spend uh, you know, a little bit of time um, hearing from students, but then also allowing some time um, to hear from, to hear, to ask, to have you have the chance to um, ask students directly. Um, so with no other um, comments, I wanna turn this over to Katie and um, take it away. Great, before uh, we even do that, I just wanted to, to thank you and, and we are in conversations, particularly on Monday with our colleagues in appropriations. And then we will hear, uh, I believe either Senator uh, Kitchell or a designee from joint fiscal, designee from joint fiscal will come down and join us probably sometime next week to, to talk about options with, you know, going forward. How can we, again, expand access, continue this kind of program, other possibilities that we might be able to do to give uh, particularly middle and low income Vermonters um, access to higher education, so. And, and Brian, you know, I realized that I said that the McClure Foundation had two, um, re two sort of reasons to, to do this. And one was to say to Vermont seniors, we care, we wanna help you. Yeah. But secondly, you know, they are, they are a foundation that's very concerned about access. And so this was a chance to remove financial issues completely. And let's see what the uptake is in terms of Vermonters um, continuing education. Because as you all know, um, you know, Vermont doesn't do well. Um, we have a very high high school graduation rate, but we, we struggle to, and to have students continuing their education. And, you know, we've tried for years. I mean, dual enrollment's helping, but we've never been able to sort of make a huge leap in terms of those stubborn figures. And this gave us a window into thinking about, okay, if we did remove finances, could Vermont really turn those figures around? And I think it's a one-off um, for sure. sure. Yep. But I think that if we can keep trying that, I think we might be able to crack that nut finally. So thank Great. you for it. Thank you for taking this on. Yeah, and thank you for being with us. Ms. Mulby, uh, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, I apologize for my tardiness. That is no, 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 no one apologizes. If I am the one who sh should be apologizing, I, if there's any mistake ever, yeah, I can assure you it can be traced back to me. Not that only generous. anything with the committee, but anything here at my house as well. <laughs> so please know that. Well, I'm impressed that the students were here on time. Addie told me she was going to log in early, and really that's the most important part of this conversation. Um, so again, my name is Katie Mobley. I'm uh, from Burlington, Vermont, and I am the Dean of Enrollment and Community Relations at CCV. Um, and I'm joined today by Anna and Addie and Nick. You will notice that Nick had the choice of either having sound or video. And so he has chosen to have sound today. And that was part of our thinking around me sort of drawing him into the conversation because Great. Um, we wanna make sure that we're hearing from all the students. Um, so Anna, I think I'm gonna start with you, but would you mind just introducing yourself and um, sort of opening up by telling us a little bit about your high school experience, maybe pre-COVID and then any impacts that COVID had on your experience? Yeah, I would love to. Uh, my name is Anna Grace Block. Um, I'm from the town of South Burlington, and I went to South Burlington High School, and I had a pretty standard <laughs> high school experience. Um, I decided to take advantage of the amazing program at CCV of early college. Um, I was really set on continuing down a medical path, um, and so I was so excited to go to CCV and get a free year of college um, during my senior year. Um, and I continued on and I kind of, it was a bit of a wake up call in the fall semester. <laughs> I was no longer at high school, um, but I really discovered um, a new passion in my spring semester of early college, um, right when uh, COVID hit that I loved everything about um, business and management and international business. Um, and I was just so thankful that early college had really opened those doors to me that I was able to figure out early on what exactly I wanted to do with my life um, for free, which was amazing. Um, and so when COVID hit, my family, um, especially my mom took it pretty hard. Uh, she has a residential cleaning business 
and her clientele went down to pretty much nothing. Um, and she's the executive director of a local cancer support nonprofit, uh, Healing Winds Vermont. And her and a few of the others volunteered to no longer get paid until they were in a more, um, a more stable condition. So the McClure gift really came at um, the best time where it took kind of the edge off of that um, CCV bill. And it was also at a time where I had realized I was not going to be able to kind of carry on with the college plans that I wanted to do. Um, so I decided to continue at CCV through the summer and the fall. And with the help of the McClure grad gift, I was actually able to um, earn my associate's degree six months after my high school diploma. So very thankful to CCV. <laughs> Amazing, Anna. That's that's a lot of hard work. Uh, <laughs> that's thank you for sharing that. Addie, do you mind going next? Sure. Um, it's an honor to be here to speak with everyone. So thank you for having me. Um, my name is Addie. Uh, I am from Brattleboro, Vermont, and I started at CCV this last fall. Um, I actually. Uh, my high school experience was not very pleasant. I grew up in foster care, and because of that, I was never really able to focus on school the way that I wanted to. And at 18, um, I wasn't able to graduate. I had to go and get a job and provide for myself. And I had never really thought about pursuing um, college because I had always had to be working and kind of taking care of myself. Um, and then once the pandemic hit, I got laid off, um, which was really stressful, but I thought that it might be the right time to maybe start back into school. Um, and so I found out about um, this program um, and it really, it changed my life. I made the phone call, got in two days later and started classes. Um, and believe it or not, I made, it, <laughs> made the Dean's List this semester, which is hugely exciting. Um, but I mean, the main financial reason or the main reason for me not pursuing a college career was also because of finances. So really, I mean, it was like a gift from God um, for me to have this opportunity. And now I'm looking at uh, pursuing a career in uh, neuroscience, I've gotten really into it. Um, and I am going to continue and get my associates at uh, here at CCV and then the world is my oyster, and I'm so excited to see what's going to happen. Addie, that's such a great thank you for sharing that and that enthusiasm. That's outstanding. And congratulations on the Dean's List. That represents a lot of work. Um, Nick, I'm going to invite you to introduce yourself and um, tell us a little bit about your high school experience. Yes. Uh, hello. I apologize for not being on camera for whatever reason. I have a bug with Zoom uh, where if I have video, I don't have sound. If I have sound, I don't have video. It's gotten very annoying. I've tried. Updating. No problem. We, we know what that is like. We're just glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was, um, let me think how I want to start. <laughs> I'm not the best at public speaking, even though this is through Zoom. Um, so my experience with this has been extremely positive. Um, I come from a low income family. Uh, and as of right now, I'm the only person who's gone to college except for uh, my mom. And um, the biggest thing for us was finances. Like how would we you know, pay for college, how would we have enough to um, pay for me and to, you know, pay bills, pay electricity, get food on the table. And um, thankfully, in high school, in my senior year, I was able to get my grades up to a point where I was able to do dual enrollment for the first six months. So I did originally VTC, um, did that. It was a lot of fun. That's when I realized how much better college was than um, high school. It was such a better experience. There wasn't like, there was no competitions on who was better. It was just people of all ages coming to learn. And that really took off the stress of learning because it wasn't a competition anymore. It was just people wanting to further their 
education and that transferred over to when I started at uh, CCV. I got in uh, last fall, did my first semester and um, currently I'm a part-time student because I'm trying to balance working at the same time of school and during a pandemic it's not really that easy. Um, my mom and my little sister both have um, compromised immune system so coming in and out of the house especially like for work or even like if they leave to go get groceries and stuff like that that's a pretty big risk so I decided to stick with part-time just so I have enough time on my hands to balance everything and um, the free class made it so I was able to use the scholarship money I got to pay for all my classes without having to uh tap in out of pocket which was really helpful because it made it get to a point where I was like man I can do college I don't have to worry about if I'll be able to pay for this because I'm eligible and it's all worked out really well Nick thank you so much did I did you mention what town you were from I know oh, but no, I just I want did. to make sure Sorry. it's on the yeah I'm from Essex Excellent. And and Nick, am I correct in thinking, do you, do you work um, in the healthcare field? Will you talk a little bit about that balance between school and the work that you're doing? Yeah. Um, mostly it's just carving out enough time to where I can do my schoolwork and have it be um, up to my own standards. Um, I'm majoring in uh, design and media studies. So thankfully it's very much hands-on. I'm doing as much freehand sketching, painting as I am like actual <laughs> writing and reading. Um, as far as like the work-school relationship, it's, I'd say it's a little bit easier <laughs> despite the fact that it's online for me because um, even though we don't, we don't have any internet at my house, so I have to use um, a hotspot. Um, but it makes it easier because I don't have to get out of bed. I mean, I do, I, <laughs> I do my schoolwork in the living room, um, but I don't have to go on any unnecessary trips. I can just do work and then I can come home and I can have enough time to do schoolwork from the time that I get home to the time that I go to bed and feel like I'm putting in enough time to both work so I can support myself and make money for myself and keep transitioning into being uh, an adult and then um, have enough time to be a student and absorb the knowledge that I'm learning from, uh, further my skill as an artist, and then also just keep furthering my education because that was the most important thing for me. I really liked high school. I like learning and college has been, infinite. surprisingly, it's been infinitely easier than high school for some reason. Um, but it's all been vastly positive. I had, so far, I don't have anything to complain about or speak negatively of, even though we're all stuck at home in a pandemic. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. Um, I will say, and I think Joyce alluded to this in her introductions, that um, on the college's end, this was a really easy program to administer, which I will just say is not always the case in programs. Um, you know, we got to say to every member of the class of 2020, this gift is for you. And so I'm I'm curious, I heard, Addie, I heard you say, you know, you heard about it and then you enrolled two days later. I, I'd love to hear from you, Addie, about sort of how did you hear about it? And um, if you were to tell someone about sort of engaging in college, what, what advice would you give them now that you've had this positive experience? So I actually heard about it from my boss who, um, is she has a spa here in Brattleboro and she was also doing classes on the side. Um, and she knew that, you know, she had to lay me off and I was gonna have a lot of time at home. Um, and she'd always kind of pushed me to, you know, go, go towards higher education. And so she came to me and said, hey, they are having this program. I know you're worried about finances, but um, this free class could, you could, you should really take advantage of this. Um, and so, like I said, I mean, I was really lucky. It was two days before the semester started and I managed to get in and, and get, be in classes two days later. Um, and so I'm really grateful for that. 
Um, I've loved my experience at CCB and, um, you know, coming from the community that I did, I know a lot of other foster kids, um, you know, and, and there's a huge stigma. A lot of us aren't pushed to, to go for more. I mean, a lot of the time we're just expected to do the bare minimum. Um, and so I've been communicating a lot with uh, my, you know, the, the people in that community um, to take advantage of this opportunity because a lot of us really are also having to fend for ourselves and um, financial, financial, this financial situations for a lot of us are not ideal. So um, I've really been spreading the word to, to everyone in my group Facebooks, you know, anyone I can just, hey, this is amazing. You know, you'll have so much support um, and it's a huge blessing. So that's, that's kind of how I'm marketing it, you know, is, is let's, show, let's show the world that we can accomplish something even after everything we've gone through. So Addie, what had you done? I'm just looking here. You were, were you in high school and then you just graduated or had you been so, in, the work, you were in the workforce a little bit? So I was still, it was my last semester of my senior year when, okay. when you're an 18, when you turn 18, um, you can't stay in your foster home anymore. And right. my family didn't, we didn't have a great, great relationship. So I had to make the decision either I'm going to couch surf and try, you know, and finish out high school. But I also, I wasn't doing very well to be completely honest. After everything I had been going through, school was never at the forefront of sure. my mind. Um, so I made the decision to drop out and get a job, get an apartment. Um, and then, um, you know, I wanted to get my GED. So I did that. Um, and it wasn't until this year, like I said, with, with this program where I, I had ever even considered that I would try to do something like this. It's great. It's, it's really great. Senator Hooker, were you going to ask something? I always do that. The screen goes to something else when I try to move. Um, I'm I'm interested in the fact that you did you got your GED, uh, Daddy, and it was a while before this gift came on line, and you were able to take advantage of that. Were there others in the program that had that were not um, 2020 grads, so to speak, that took advantage uh, of the gift? So you had to be a 2020 grad. So Addie, I'm, I'm assuming that you earned your GED within the year of 2020. Yes, I did. I um, had completed three of them, but kind of put off the math, math one. Okay. Um, I'm not a math whiz. So I had to do a lot of studying. And also, you know, with just working so hard, um, I just, I hadn't had time until 2020 to, to get that done. Um, so luckily I passed. <laughs> and technically, and so it happened that it was in 2020 and you were right there to take advantage of the gift. And that's great. Another, another question, if I may. Oh, sure. Um, Joyce, Judy, um, I'm looking at the geographic spread, you know, and we have two kids from two students from Chittenden County, one from down in Brattleboro. Can you give us an idea of what the spread was, either you or, or Katie? Yes, I can. Um, actually, we were really thrilled. We had we had participants from every county, and the highest concentration was from Essex County. Okay. Which is so we had we were thrilled at the. Um, level of participation. And I will say, you know, I am so grateful to Addie and Anna and Nick, because I think as Brian will say, you know, we got this request a couple days ago and we really scrambled to find, to, to reach out. And so I'm so glad that they were able to, but um, yeah, we, um, we were very pleased. We had, there was not a pocket that, okay, like, you know, all these students came from Chittenden County or all these, no, they came from everywhere. And we were particularly pleased with the number of students who came from Essex County, right. you know, way, you know, it's pretty not, not a, a, you know, it's not a very populated County. And so, yeah, we actually had that breakdown in terms of the sp spread. Oh, it was, it was impressive. And then one more question. 
Uh, do you have a breakdown of the number of students who took advantage of the program that were already taking courses, whether it was through dual enrollment or the free college year, you know, um, and we're kind of adding on to their course of study as opposed to students who were taking the course as a, a first time and a one-off? Yeah, we have, well, um, I can answer your question in, in, a, in this way. We can tell you how many students, how many students of it, that use the McClure gift took only one course mm -hmm. last fall and how many took multiple courses. I don't have that figure right in front of me. Katie, do you? I can I get can, you that. Yeah, yeah. we can. Um, but what we saw is we saw a number, and I think for some reason about 50% sticks in my, but I can't remember, who were just simply taking that one course. And then we saw students who were taking two, but with a free course added one. And we also saw, which is interesting, not a huge number, but we did have a number of students who were enrolled at other colleges like UVM and, and added a CCV course hmm. um, to their load because it was free. Um, and so they could, you know, so they took a full load at, at UVM, like maybe four or five courses and added a course at CCV. So we did see some students who, because also they could access it from wherever they were. So even if they weren't living in Vermont and they were going to school somewhere, they could access an online course. And, um, and so we had um, some who were enrolled in other schools um, add to their mix by taking a course at CCV. So it was, a, it was an interesting combination. People used it in lots of different ways. Thank you. And thank you students for sharing your stories. It's impressive. Senator Perslick. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I have some questions about kind of around CCV and dual Rome and not specifically about this program. Is that okay? Yeah, please go ahead. And a question for the students and maybe the folks from CCV can answer too. And, is, and that, I just wonder what the student's perspective, because it sounds like everybody did early enrollment as, as well as, not early enrollment, early college, as well as this program. And I just wonder what the experience is when you have high schoolers in, the, in these college classes. And it seemed like well, from my daughter did it, it seemed like some of her classes, she said, there was a lot of high schoolers in the class. And I don't know if that's, if that's just since it's a community college, you're going to have a variety. But I wondered what your perspective was about either the benefits or not of having a mix of high schoolers and other students in the classes. Does that make sense as a question? It does. Anna, do you want to answer that? So not, I would say Addy did not participate, if I'm correct, Addy, shake me off, but um, did not participate in a dual enrollment or early college. Anna did. But do you want to talk about that experience? Yes. Um just as a high school student in a class with people of all ages and just how my experience was. Um, it was, well, it was interesting to say the least because on one end of the spectrum, you have um, the students like me who have never taken a college class before. And it's kind of all, you know, bright eyed, bushy tailed, like <laughs> we'll do whatever the professor says, <laughs> we're a little nervous. And then um, on the other end, you have kind of these lifelong learners that have so much um, experience and inspiration and advice really to give. And they have, I've learned so much. Um, I remember this one woman in my human anatomy and physiology class. And I think that she was, uh, I think 55 and she had been a single mother and she was, I think she's one of the hardest working people I've ever known. And there was a bit of a language barrier. And sometimes it was, you know, kind of hard to understand everything that she was saying, or sometimes she couldn't quite understand us. But there was just kind of this really interesting bond that formed between her and the entire class, where we all learned so much from her and the professor. And it was just really interesting to see how all of these people are there, not because you know, they feel like they have to, or because, you know, you know, mom or dad or whoever said that they must go to college, but they're there because they genuinely want to learn more about the world around them. And they want to apply this in an amazingly useful way in their life. And I think that itself really brought me out of my shell and really gave me 
um, a newfound appreciation for education. It really is, is a good question. <laughs> reciprocal yeah. exchange, really, students and teachers. It's great. Senator Perslick, sorry to interrupt. No, that's good. Um, thank you for that. And, and I guess a quick question for Joyce and Katie is, have, have you ever had a college student that's me you know, like, why do I have these high schoolers in my class? Um, I'm assuming not just from the, my, the experience from my daughter, because she felt like the high school students worked harder than some of the college students. But part of that is this, like a lot of the other ones had jobs and, and some of the high schoolers didn't. So, but has that ever come up like you know, here, I, yes, you know, I would say that, you know, and, you know, I'm looking at Senator Lyons, who, you know, as a faculty member and can probably speak to this better um, being on the ground. Um, but I will say, you know, this is one of the benefits of, C, of a CCD classroom. It is the rich diversity and and age is one of those pieces. And I think, um, you know, as Anna so, um, so said so well, is that, you know, people come together in a class because they're really, it's, unite, it's united in the learning and it sort of levels the playing field because it doesn't really matter if you're 16 or 80, you're there to learn. And so I think that, you know, this is one of the things that we, um, we do, that I think our faculty do amazingly well is celebrate that diversity and people can learn from each other um, in really, um, really significant ways. I will, um, I mean, our average age is still in the high 20s. So even though we have more younger students, our average age is about 28. Um, it used to be 31, but I will say about 50% of our students now are traditional age students. But we also have a lot of students, you know, between the ages of 30 and 55, particularly people who are thinking of shifting careers. They've been hurt on the job. They've been, you know, there's just a number of reasons why people come back. But um, I don't know, Senator Lyons, do you have something to say about that? Because it is, it's just this melting pot of diversity in our classes. And I think faculty do an amazing job at, at, at using that. But I will just ask Senator Lyons if she- Oh, I think you've done a, a great time job. For us. Yeah, yeah, you've done a great job explaining it. Um, and even my, my historical knowledge from Trinity College is similar. So uh, the mix is really, is enriching at both ends of the spectrum. So the students like Anna who come in and are just hungry for learning theoretical and basic information uh, joined with people who have all that practical experience at the other end. Um, it's kind of neat to see. It, and it, it makes for a very interesting, I don't know, maybe you two uh, or three could talk about your classroom experiences and working with um, some of the non-traditional students. I mean, there, you have to have had some kind of interaction and in picking up some of their skills and knowledge. Nick, do you mind starting just so we get you back in to that question? Did you hear that question from Senator Lyons? Yes. Um... I think the best part about having a diverse classroom is that you get a lot, you get, in some ways you get fresher eyes. Um, I'd say the two experience that stuck out most to me was uh, the first one when I was in uh, dual enrollment for Vermont Tech in my senior year, there was a guy in my class, he was like, I think either 60 or 70 and he was a veteran and he was taking electrical engineering simply because he was retired he didn't work anymore and it was something to do and as the weeks went on during the semester um because we were all in the same classroom pretty frequently um we got to hear stories from him from what it was like um, when he was young, not only just being at war, but like how different the world was. And for him, VTC, the class was as much about, you know, learning a new skill like electrical engineering, but also it, he said it got him out of the house. He said he loved coming in because he was able to, he was able to do something every day and he was able to feel wanted again. And he was able to do something that um challenged him and he was able to learn a new skill um 
The second experience that also stands out the most is uh, recently last semester. So my first semester at CCB, um, one of my classmates, he's a full-time firefighter and he is, uh, I think he has like three kids and he's on the job constantly and uh, in our forums we would talk and he said um, this was for my oh, which class was it um, intro to visual communication um, his whole thing was just he wanted to have another skill besides his career under his belt something that he enjoyed doing he said he enjoyed doing art he became a firefighter because it was something that was um, in the family uh, his father was a firefighter and um, he uh, he's would talk about like how he would mostly be at the station when he was doing his classes like when we would do uh, a zoom lecture or when we would be doing our forums he would be at Nick, I think we, we lost your, uh, are you there? Yep. Yeah. Addie, do you want to jump in? And Nick, if you get back, just jump in. Did you have an experience, Addie, with sort of a mixed classroom environment you want to share? Yeah, not so much last semester, but this semester I'm taking sociology um, and there is a huge melting pot of there. different ages in that class. Oh, I think Nick's back. I want to let him finish. I don't want to interrupt him. So, Nick, are you there? Yeah, sorry. It seems no like problem. I just no problem. lost connection for a minute. Um, uh, let me think. Uh, I was saying uh, they brought very unique viewpoints because it's, you know, in each respective sense, they're different people, but both have very unique views on not only the world, but on education from, you know, two different times, mingling with people like me who are out of high school and still learning about what life is. And then you have them who have been around for a while and they know what life is and they've built lives for themselves. And they're just coming full circle where some of us are just starting out on our journey to learning. And it's very refreshing because as much as I love talking to people my own age, it's always nice to get a different viewpoint on how people see the world, see education, how they have their own opinions about it, and how everyone learns in their own different ways. Great. Uh, I'm wondering, and I think this might be for Joyce and, and or Katie, you know, I'm thinking about uh, how you in general market, you know, and are getting the word out. I know I remember hearing Nick talk, I remember there was a comment at one point from uh, President Judy either this year or in years past that, you know, not as many men are taking advantage of, of, of CCV. And then uh, Addie had her uh, own experience as, as a foster uh, child and then, you know, a, a GED student. Are there ways that you are marketing to these particular groups? And then Anna, uh, in some ways, uh, I'm not sure, you know, again, just broadly how, how we're reaching, how we're reaching certain groups. Well, I can talk just generically, but probably Anna and Addie and Nick can probably tell you more about how they heard about it directly. But I will tell you, Senator Campion, that is this is a huge challenge. Katie oversees uh, marketing and communications, mm -hmm. and you know, um, we we uh, we appeal to such a diverse audience that trying to target our our message. Um, to a particular audience, we are constantly thinking about, okay, how do we reach this group? And how do we reach this group? Because it's very, it's a very different message to someone who's 17 than someone who's 60 and is going to switch yeah. careers. Yeah. In the same way to, you know, we serve around 300 veterans a semester. Well, really trying to figure out how to market to, to particular groups um, is is a constant challenge and we are always you know trying to figure out okay what message here what message there so and then you add to the mix of you know for years ago you know if you hit radio newspaper and tv you were good you know those were the ways that you did it well now you've got social media and so many different platforms on social media and but you can't leave tv and radio and and print behind you've got to keep those going but also you know, our audience, 
you know, so much of our, our promotional stuff happens with social media because that's how students learn about us. And then by far the most important thing is relationships. Right. It's our relationships with people in school. Yep. It's our relationships with teachers who teach high school students. It's relationships with different, um, you know, entities in the community. We are always, and then with businesses, because I think as Addie said, you know, it was her, her boss who encouraged her to go back to school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, it's just a web and it's, you know, and we are always working at it. We always can do better. But I, Katie, I don't know if you want to add to that. And I think it's oh, the Joyce. American experience is now, if you move into a community, you, you are looking sometimes for a community college. I mean, you know, they mm -hmm. are part of, you know, certainly the state's landscape, the country's landscape. I, I'm hoping more and more people, you know, are, are thinking, hey, you know, you look where you're living and around the community college for a variety of different things, classes, cultural opportunities, experiences, things like that. You know, one, one other thing, particularly related to the McClure gift, which I think was pretty interesting that we had as many students as we did take advantage of it. We did not ramp this up. The McClure Foundation came to us the beginning of June. This was, so we had had, you know, COVID, we were two months into the COVID environment. Um, you know, we were at the end of a traditional school year. So in terms of working with guidance counselors and, you know, trying to get stuff out to high school seniors, you know, this was, so in, you know, the beginning of June is when we actually, you know, they came to us and said, we want to do this. And in two weeks we had stood it up yeah. and, but by then kids were graduating. Yeah. And so that was just a challenge in and of itself because the normal channels through, through our school network were, you know, summer's a different beast than, than the school year. And, so. and just so you know, Ms. Weir from the McClure Foundation said that you were all incredible partners in that, you know, you, they came to you at the timing that they came to you and you were all able to get this ball rolling. And that was, that was great. Katie's group. That okay. Congratulations. Up. Congratulations. Other questions, colleagues? Uh, Senator Hooker. That said about the marketing and the timing, you had 600 plus students participate of, and that, I believe Ms. Weir said it was what, 10%, how many of, 10% of the graduates? What if they had all done it? Would you have been able to accommodate them? We would have been able to accommodate it. And quite frankly, that was one of the things that, so when the McClure Foundation, you know, they, you know, they are an extremely um, uh, well-positioned foundation. But they, you know, when they came to us, they were like, so do you think you'll have 200 or 1,000 or 600? Because, you know, they, they didn't give us a grant and say, okay, we can only serve this much. Mm -hmm. They were committed to whoever came through. And so we could, have, we could have handled it on the CCV end. But, you know, we were curious to see how many people. So, you know, this is, the, this is one of the beauties of the CCV model. We can flex grow and, and um, you know, if we have to pull back, we can. It's, we're, you know, we, we just have a very non-traditional budget model that works really well, you know, and this, I credit, you know, this is um, the budget model that was established when CC was established 50 years ago, to be able to respond to shifting environments and um, I'm pretty grateful for that. So Senator Hooker, yes, we could have, we were ready, we can, ramp up, we can add courses. Um, because, you know, we, we have a lot of, we have a lot of faculty networks, and we have a lot of people that are very interested in, um, in teaching for CCD, far more than we have um, courses for. And Senator Hooker, I would just add that, you know, when we had preliminary conversations with Carolyn, where she said, you know, how many typically high school grads immediately the year after do you serve and it's about 300 and then you know we sort of got aspirational and I will say you know I, as a staff member we thought well maybe we could get 400 450 and when we had to go back to them and say wow we're at like over 600 it, it was um it was amazing it really it, it in such a tight time frame I mean I think had we had 
six months to have, you know, Anna have the conversation with a school counselor or map this out, I have no doubt we could have tripled that number. But um, it, it was a little, to Joyce's point, the fact that they were willing to just say, just go. It's really easy to message something that's clear and easy and free. And it's more complicated when there's like, oh, you're interested in this, but okay, wait, do you qualify for this? Or do you, it doesn't mean there isn't opportunity there, but this was the easiest thing to promote that I've ever been involved in at CCB. And it was, it was great during COVID for sure. Senator Persley. Um, on that note, and I don't know if either Abby or of the others from CCB know, I thought the state had done a special grant program specifically for those that are experiencing foster care. I thought I remembered a few years ago, something passed that said the state basically is gonna take the responsibility um, for those that don't you know, have the parental care. So, but, but it sounds like maybe I misunderstood what that was, or is there a special program for foster care that give them full tuition at state college? Uh, is it okay if I answer, Katie? Yes. Um, so I looked into a lot of different programs. Um, unfortunately, like I said, I really only had two days to get it together. Um, not from my knowledge. I have been working a lot with VSAC, um, and I was able to obtain a lot of grants through them. Um, also through the FAFSA, because I am con considered an independent student, I was able to get that extra funding, but I wasn't able to find anything through the state of Vermont for kids coming from the background that I was. Um, I would say that VSAC is also an incredible program that has been invaluable um, to my ability for, for me to be able to help define this extra funding, get help with, you know, because I'm also trying to figure out how to fill out the FAFSA on my own, which is not easy. I mean, they've been incredibly helpful. Also, um, my CCB uh, counselor has been amazing. But yeah, I mean, I kind of had to, go out and search for that funding after I got in. And um, it was a little difficult, but I was able to navigate that through um, both my CCB advisor and my VSAC counselor. Great, thank you. Anna, I just wanna bring you back into the conversation here. First of all, your mother sounds like an incredible person. She, the way you <laughs> described her was, was really wonderful and she must be incredibly proud. Um, you, did you do your entire high school, your senior year in high school at CCB? Is, I did. You did. So you 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 got the you did dual enrollment all the way mm -hmm. uh, the entire year. And in part, did you say was high school in some ways that senior year just not a fit, or you felt as though academically you wanted to to broaden your horizons? What what made you do that? Um, well, from my freshman year of high school, I was talking to my high school counselor about graduating high school a year early. Mm -hmm. um, I was already a year ahead of my peers, um, and I kind of like to fast track myself. And he had uh, suggested the early college program. And it was something that was kind of at the back of my mind until junior year, um, when I realized that high school, um, well, was high school, and I felt that it would be a much better fit if I went to college. And since I really wanted to graduate a year early, I realized that this was the most practical thing to do. Um, it saved me money and it got me amazing experience that then fast tracked me to um, go on and get my associate's degree at 17, so. Great. Any other questions or comments? Anything from our guests, Anna, Nick, or Addie, or certainly Joyce or Katie? I, I defer to students. Do you have any any final comments for this committee? For those of you from uh, Chittenden County, just know that Senator Lyons and Senator Chittenden are your two senators. Uh, and um, from Brattleboro, we don't have anybody here uh, that represents uh, Wyndham County, but uh, Senators uh, Ballant and uh, White are your two uh, go-to folks in the Senate. Anna and I are also both SB alums, go Wolves. So. <laughs> um, Senator Hooker. 
I do have a question that is off topic now, sort of, but maybe connected. Um, with the onset of the pandemic, we try to help people retool. And I'm just wondering what kind of response CCV had from uh, Vermonters who were looking to take courses to help them either get different jobs or, you know, just try to uh, change their directions. And Senator Hooker, are you referring specifically to CRF funds that we um, yeah. received? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we had um, over 600, 700 students um, enroll. And that again was over the course of a weekend to set this up. So we had a lot of, um, you know, and, you know, I, I think this is an indication of, you know, once again, we were able to remove the financial barrier from, from investing in yourself. And we saw so many adults want to come forward and they, you know, and the testimony and the survey information about why they hadn't engaged earlier in education. It's interesting if you look at the graph, the number of people that said it's just about finances, it was huge. So we had a huge number of people that, um, that took advantage of that CRF funding to, um, to sort of invest in their education and sort of figure out ways that they were gonna pivot to something different post COVID. And, and it seems from your descriptions of setting up both these programs that there's a real need to look at the red tape involved in getting into other programs. So that may be something that we should take a look at as well to make it easier for students like these young people to get involved and for people who are older to you know, have the supports that they need as life changes. So. No, I think that's a really, really wonderful observation because one of the things that I think, you know, we, we and I will use the collective in this group now, you know, approach things um, from a place that we know about higher education. We know the language of higher education. We know what needs to happen. And, you know, there are many people who have never been to college aren't surrounded by people or supported by people who understand that language of college. Anything can feel like, like it's, it's impossible or it's just too hard to do. And so, you know, the number of students that we, that we, work with who don't understand that um, that you that you that you that finance that there's financial support to help them and how they apply I think Addie referred to the VSAC counselor helping her apply to the FAFSA form the FAFSA form is hard and it you know it doesn't if you you know after you've done it once or twice it's not so hard but the first time it feels really overpowering and it asks for questions you know it asks like for your parents income well, someone like Addie, you know, that's a hard, that's, well, what do I do about that? Mm -hmm. um, so, and Addie, I'm, you know, I'm just using you as a, you know, I, I don't know how you dealt with that, but, you know, there's things that we have put in place that just make it really difficult for people to, to get through that system. So one of the things that we're always working, like our admissions process, it's, I hope it's pretty straightforward for people. And it was great to hear that a couple of people were able to do it, you know, from start to finish within two days. Because we have really worked at that to make the application. We're open admissions, but people still have to, you know, they have to apply, but it's a very, very simple and hopeful a straight, straightforward process because, you know, you get it doing that and you run into a stumbling block and, the, and people are gone. Okay, that's, that's not for me. You know, and they take themselves out of the game. So simple is really important. And I, and I mean, simple in terms of ease. It doesn't have to be simple, but it has to be easy and there can't be glitches. Yeah. Senator Lyons. So, you know, given that and given that the McClure uh, grant was so uh, simplified and folks could simply could access the tuition dollars that they needed without a complex process. So I guess this is for the for, for the students. Um, once that burden was off your shoulders, then what were the supports that you found at CCV that, that enabled you to succeed? You know, because it looked to me as if there was a much higher success rate with that, with the McClure cohort, cohort of students. I'm not positive about that, but it looked like that. So I'm just, just maybe Ann or, or, or Addie um, or Nick could just speak to 
what the supports were after the money was delivered <laughs> that helped you. I'll start with Anna. Thank you for doing that, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think that my support stayed pretty consistent. Um, my parents have always been a huge support to me, um, especially my mom. And I think that also my CCB advisor was a huge help throughout the entire process. Um, sometimes I would frantically email him and he would, you know, email me back in this very calm, like explaining, like, this is how this is going to work. You're, you know, it'll be fine. <laughs> so I really appreciate um, just his patience and also, especially the professors, um, because they really took the time to understand um, everything that was going on and to translate that into their lesson plans um, and understand that things are really wonky right now and that students are doing their best, but also knowing when to kind of give that nudge of, well, we can't let you, you know, not do any work at all. Um, and so I think really just having the support of the advising system and having the professors after that financial burden was taken away, it was, um, it really spurred me to keep going and to look past CCV um, and everything that they had given me and look towards my, my next education step. Great. Anything else? We so Nick, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, once the McClure Foundation grants went through, um, I too had a bit of a frantic uh, couple of times when I would email my advisor and also my um, VSAC financial advisor because I also had to do a uh, FAFSA. And I remember it took about three days, three consecutive days where uh, we had to do phone calls to explain how to do it. And um, I, I just remember how I always felt supported. Um, my guidance counselor, she's always really nice and really warming and really calm. So even when I would email her like three times in a row, like, hi, so I don't know what to do with this form because it has um, my dad's income on it. I don't talk to him as much and he doesn't give me that information. She's like, okay, so this is what we can do to get around that. And the same thing with my financial advisor. She was really good with thoroughly explaining everything because I, I wanted to understand what it was I was filling out so that if anything like financially happened, I, I could keep track of it and be responsible for myself as well. And I just remember how, you know, she didn't give me a hard time when I would ask questions and um, she would always be really nice. And if I needed something explained a little bit more in depth, because sometimes finances can be like that, she was always really accommodating. And um, the pro professors are really nice. Everyone's been really accommodating with uh, my unique situation of not having internet, but having internet because I have a hotspot. Um, I've had a few times where I've dropped out of a Zoom class on accident and haven't been able to get back in and um, just like a quick email and being like, hey, so sometimes I may accidentally drop off the face of the Zoom and return five minutes later if I can get it working. And um, it's nice only having to explain that once or twice and then not, you know, getting in trouble or getting penalized and just having people be supportive and understanding that some of us aren't exactly in the most ideal situations for online learning, but we are still making the best out of it and um, doing good classes. Great. Thank you all so much for being with us today. This was incredibly informative and, and interesting. Uh, you're all doing great work. We're all proud of you, that's for sure. And here to support you in any way we can as you move forward. And I hope you'll keep in contact with us uh, with either, you know, directly with the committee or with your elected uh, senators and representatives 
it's, it's important to hear directly from the field and you've provided us with a really great look into CCB in your own lives, which, which is, uh, means a lot to us. So thank you all very much. Thank you all for this time. And, and again, I just wanna thank the students for taking the time to share your stories. They are, they are powerful and so inspiring to all of us. So thank you. Thank and thank you. you senators for allowing us to do this. It was fun. That. Great way to end a week. Absolutely. Thank this you. was a dream come true for me. I'm really into government. So I was, <laughs> yeah, this was really, I mean, I'm like starstruck. So I'm really excited. So thank you guys so much for having me. Thank You're you awesome so much. Thank you so much. Your Thanks, honor. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great. Uh, committee, let's take a, a 10 minute break and we'll come back and Jim is going to take us through uh, yesterday's work on uh, a draft literacy bill, an updated draft uh, based on yesterday's testimony. Uh, great, so see you in uh, about 10.30.